This is the first overhead in your paper. How many of you are familiar with these uh, sets of equations uh, with the ARPS? Okay. These equations were developed uh, by ARPS way back in the, uh, with the early 30s and early 40s. It's the observation of that he was able to take a bunch of uh, field data and he came up uh, basically with two separate type equations. One's called the exponential or, or uh, decline exponent uh, b of zero. Uh, it's a very simple equation and you can see that if you separate it that you could plot this, uh, the rate time data on uh, a semilog graph paper with uh, the log of rate versus time and it would form a straight line. <laughs> and this was a very uh, convenient equation particularly before the advent of the computer is that uh, it was very simple to plot the data uh, on semilog and almost everybody in the industry even up till maybe five years ago everybody was doing their reserves in the states based on exponential decline with actual performance data because it was uh, convenient. Uh, uh, at the advent of the computer though, well this form of equation was very difficult in order to handle uh, manually so that's why nobody ever used this back in the early days, the hyperbolic. You can almost show that there's almost no case that you can derive that, uh, uh, analytically that you can come up with exponential. Uh, there's a couple exceptions and I'll, I'll tell them to you now. We'll, we'll go through them later just to kind of give you an idea. One, a single phase liquid reservoir, you know, totally undersaturated would be all exponential decline. But nobody produces those uh, uh, types of reservoirs that way. They usually water flood them immediately or they're subject to strong water drive. So you're not going to see exponential there. Uh, uh, high pressure gas. You know, if you get in five and ten thousand pound range, gas behaves exactly like liquid. The compressibilities uh, of gas at those pressure levels is uh, exactly like liquid. So, very high pressure gas reservoirs are going to undergo exponential decline. Uh, again, you tell me the pressure level, and I'll tell you what type of decline. Uh, 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 again, particularly for gas. Uh, very uh, 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 oil reservoirs with very poor relative perm curves. It gets back to to uh, recovery efficiency. If the relative perm is very bad, you, uh, you're going to produce primarily the gas uh, I, I, I instead of oil. You can get something that's going to look like exponential, like a B value of point 0.1. Difference between uh, point 0.1 and exponential, you couldn't tell on a I, I plot. And if you get into the low pressure uh, gas area, and if you're uh, tubing limited, you know, because you've put uh, a, a too small a diameter tubing in your well and you're uh, uh, entirely friction bound, the production at the surface it, uh, is restricted by the tubing size, okay? Uh, that pressure drop, or the uh, total pressure drop to the system is going to be primarily a function of uh, a friction drop. And your wellhead deliverability curve, back pressure curve, is going to have a slope of 0.5, which is the square root of a difference in pressure squared, just a basic fundamental fluid flow through pipe. And if you have a slope of 0.5 on a wellhead curve, you're going to end up uh, even in the low pressure gas area with exponential decline. You know, so these are the basic fundamental uh, things. This is why we plot uh, back pressure curve data for gas wells. You show me the value of, uh, of the slope of the curve and I'm going to tell you what exponential decline. We'll get into that some more. Uh, again, the ARPS equ uh, uh, equation uh, in a hyperbolic, normally uh, the B ranges between uh, point 0.2 and 1 was very difficult to handle because you didn't get a straight line on graph paper. So it was a very complicated way of doing it uh, manually 
There's an example in a presentation that I'll show you uh, or later. We won't go through it other than you'll see how it was done. But the advent of the computer uh, changed things. Uh, people started doing regression analysis. And I'll show you uh, from the type curve, there's, there's a big region on uh, the ARPS uh, dimensionless uh, type curve where all of these from B of 1 to B of 0 all overlay. Okay. So if you fit anything in that region, you can get any answer that you want, statistically. Uh, physically, though, it isn't going to make sense that you can't have that value B. It's very important to understand that the limit on B is between uh, 0 and 1, that you can't get a B value in excess of 1. It's physically impossible. What people were doing, though, was uh, like in the States, there was a region, and you're going to get into it here. We've got some of the regions here. Low permeability reservoirs. Uh, uh, I stimulate a good stimulation treatment. The rate, time, data, and transient looks. Uh, uh, if you were to try and fit it to ARPS equation, you're gonna, uh, you can get B values as high as 3. Uh, it's the use of transient data in the ARPS equation, where the ARPS equation is strictly depletion. It's got to be in pseudo steady state. Your entire system has to be in pseudo steady state or depletion for the ARPS equation to be applicable. Yeah. Uh, any transient data utilized in the regression fit is, uh, is going to automatically give you uh, a higher B value than if you eliminate it. So you have to be able uh, to identify, and you can do it by the type curve. Uh, uh, log of rate versus log of time, you can exactly determine what data is in transient by plotting it on a, a log log and uh, fitting it on type curve. A and to utilize this equation, you'd have to reinitialize the data in the pseudo steady state period. Okay? Remember, though, that this has got to be in pseudo-steady state. And the Q sub i is nothing more than a flow rate off the stabilized back pressure curve, period. That's the physical meaning. When you start to get in again into the transient behavior, you can have... Uh, a lot of people thought that the Q sub i was a rate that occurred in the early production life of a uh, well or a field. It's not. Because if you have a, a low permeability stimulated well, you can have a transient flow rate in early times three times the value of the Q sub i that you'd get from uh, the analysis of your data. Yeah. So there is a physical definition of that. And again, I can relate the B value to the slope of the back pressure curve, and the D sub i is nothing more than the ratio of Q sub i over the gas or oil in place. That's all it is. And you don't grab a number out of the air. some uh, textbooks, modern textbooks out, uh, th that still say there is no physical basis for the use of the ARPS equation. You know, it's just experience or historical data. And I had my uh, secretary look up herself in her dictionary the word empirical, because the ARPS equation is considered to be totally empirical. And all that says if it's empirical, it's relying solely on practical experience and without regard for system or theory, that there's no basis other than that's the way it is. You know. Now, uh, I hope before we finish here that you kind of uh, can see there is a physical basis for, for the ARPS equations. Uh, you can define the B and the Q sub I and the D from basic reservoir uh, parameters. Uh, fluid properties, uh, the back pressure curve, the KH and skin, and so uh, the gas in place. I mentioned to you earlier. I think there's been an update. There's been an update to Nin's book. He's out of Canada, uh, Calgary. I think he's in Calgary. Reservoir Engineering Fundamentals is the book. Your production rate decline curves. The original book was in 63, but he's had an update recently, within the past maybe four or five years, and uh, nothing's changed within there. And he says 
When estimates are based on the mathematical or graphical techniques of production rate decline curve analysis, it should always be remembered that this analysis is merely a convenience, uh, a method that is amenable to mathematical or graphical treatment and has no basis in physical laws of governing the flow of oil and gas through the formation. And again, I hope by the time that we're finished that you'll understand that that is not a true statement, that there is a basis for it. And uh, uh, don't be deceived and you know with the idea that well we we do all our work here in models and so on and so forth well uh, a couple points the, the the rate time decline even of the field data and the model that you're trying to do to match it the B value that you're going to get has a physical significance and I think Mike is working in that area now on some of the office work that he's doing you know so it you got to match the rate time decline or your forecast not going to be very accurate is it all reservoirs go on decline. You know, we we can't produce at a constant rate forever, and we don't have infinite reserves. Uh, now, in my spare time, I used to take time out to read Muscat. You know, he's the yeah to me he's the father of uh, petroleum and reservoir engineering. Uh, uh, it was amazing what he knew and understand in the 30s in the 40s when he wrote his two books that there's nothing been invented new since he did his original work but he did it all by hand a lot of people wondered uh, uh, what he would have done had he come along during the age of the computer he worked for golf uh, in Pittsburgh out at the research uh, I'm originally from uh, Pennsylvania uh, in the Pittsburgh area I went to University of Pittsburgh and uh, uh, the head of the petroleum engineering department at that time was Professor Bossett, uh, and he was the inventor of the relative permeability curve. You know, it, they ran the experiment. He worked with Muscat I, 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 in Pittsburgh, and I got this out of his uh, book because it's uh, applicable. Uh, uh, a quotation from his book, uh, the hundreds of oil fields that were discovered before 1930 and that are now depleted have the only item of physical significance that can be derived from the available records of the great majority of currently depleted fields is the curve of field production rate versus time. You know, this is what we're talking about, rate versus time. Uh, uh, well, they, the fields, were generally produced wide open at maximum capacity with no control. Uh, uh, and this is my uh, underlining in, in, uh, in brackets. You know, this is the ideal uh, situation for uh, rate time decline. You know, so we can go back and look at a lot of these old fields, uh, their performance behavior. And these were the types of fields uh, that Cutler and Arps uh, uh, you are taking that data and that's how they came up with the empirical or at least ARPS came up with the empirical uh, rate time decline based on field data. The reason uh, that Muscat made this statement is he derived the uh, solution gas drive reservoir performance equations and uh, what he was really doing here was complaining there's no data out there anywhere that he could test his equations with because they didn't take pressure, they didn't measure gas oil ratio, they didn't take fluid samples, uh, they didn't core the wells to get permeability. So the only thing you had for literally hundreds of fields, the field performance was rate time data. And uh, remember, they basically produced them wide open. And I'll show you uh, I, I, in a little bit what that means. Uh, uh, ARPS had made a plot of the cumulative percent of uh, uh, leases or fields uh, versus the decline exponent B uh, using uh, uh, Cutler's data and there was about 149 fields 
uh, and, uh, and you have to remember that the, the uh, original development of the decline curve e uh, equation was based on oil fields only. You know, in those days, they didn't even produce gas. It was worthless. When I worked out in the Panhandle, we, uh, uh, we were selling some gas at uh, three cents an MCF. And, and that was in 1954, 1955. You know, it was virtually worthless. What uh, 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 was happening before that, there was an area in a West Panhandle field, which is a giant uh, gas field uh, with a large gas cap and an oil rim, uh, uh, well, the West Panhandle field that was discovered in the 20s as oil, and uh, the gas was there, but there wasn't anything uh, that you can do with it. Uh, but people were taking the gas and flooring it to recover the liquids out of it only. You know, uh, 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 otherwise, it had no value. They were also using it to make carbon black, too. But what he found was that there, uh, in ninety percent of uh, the field releases had B values less than 0.5. This is very important. The maximum value that you can derive analytically, or any way, or run models, or do anything, the maximum value of B that you can have for a single layer reservoir system is 0.5. Okay, so anything in excess of that is trying to tell you you have a layer no cross flow reservoir. And this is one of the impacts of understanding you, uh, with the value of B as a diagnostic tool. And as you can see, for uh, I, I zero or, or even a B value of 0.1, less, uh, roughly 10% had B values that you might classify as exponential. Uh, and I'm going to show you, uh, with the use of the type curve and uh, ARP's example in his original paper of an exponential decline, was in a region that, that you could not prove it was exponential. All the B values overlay each other in that region, uh, you, uh, so people calling things exponential at that time were not really exponential for sure. You couldn't prove that it was exponential. Uh, in no case did he come up with a B value in excess of 0.7. Uh, and again, you have to realize that there was a period, uh, maybe 10 years ago or so, where a lot of people were use, or were coming up with statistical analysis, uh, computer statistical analysis of production performance data with B values as high as 3. Uh, and I'll show you later the absurdity of that number is you uh, uh, if you take the reserves that that extrapolated to, it could be f uh, five to ten times original oil or gas in place. You know that's the absurdity. But I said, well, that's okay because we we're going to run economics on our production or our projections, and the discount factor in economics is going to take care of that. So they just kind of blew the problem away. You know, they blew it off. That well, it really don't make any difference. And We'll show you through uh, at least a couple of and when you include the transient data uh, into the depletion data, it's always going to give you a very high B value, and the uh, the high B values are trying to tell you it's transient data. Okay, and the implication if it is transient data for long times, that's a classic case for infill drilling. Uh, uh, I'm also going to show you that you can get high B values for layered no cross flow it's a classic case to not do infill drilling. And if you plot them on, if you look at the data on semi-log, you can't tell the difference. If you plot it log-log, you can exactly tell. Is it transient or, or is it uh, a high B value? I'll show you those examples. I'm just trying to uh, basically set the stage for, for what you should anticipate during some of these discussions, what you should be looking for. In uh, 1969, uh, Ramsey and Guerrero, they were, I think this was a master's thesis at the University of Tulsa, uh, wanted to see through uh, selecting uh, 202 leases where they, they judiciously selected them so that there was no additional uh, drilling going on at the time on any of the leases. You know, that will screw up your interpretation. Uh, well, uh, none of the wells were uh, producing water. Uh, and they come out with a slightly different 
uh, your distribution, the original ARPs, but still, in no case was there a B value in excess of one. And what you have to remember, these the, the fields that were produced during that era were produced wide open. So you had no chance of developing any type of supplemental drives. The gas cap expansion, water influx, uh, gravity segregation. Also, when you get into this era, you know, 69, you're in the area of uh, uh, lower permeability reservoirs, hydraulic fracturing, and you start introducing some of the transient data too. See, so, but uh, still, uh, uh, in no case do you have a B value in excess of one. That that uh, well, the higher B values that you're getting here are kind of a reflection of of a. Uh, 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 a developing more efficient drive mechanism because you're giving them, you're not producing them wide open. It gives you a chance for uh, gravity segregation, gas cap expansion, and uh, water influx to develop. Also remember the transient. So when we were moving from uh, downtown Bartlesville out to the R&D facility, well, uh, one of the technicians ran into a report the, uh, uh, I think I've got the data on there somewhere. Uh, oh, 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 okay, 1931, and he thought, well, this is this is an old report, it'd be worthless should he throw it away, and I decided to kind of take a look at it, and I'm glad that I did, because there's some uh, uh, very interesting performance data in here. Uh, uh, with these three fields here, we're going to look at uh, with the Mejia, uh, the Wortham, and the Powell field uh, uh, in East Texas, uh, in the Woodbine. They're all uh, basically full water drive fields. You know, here's the East Texas field over here, the uh, I, I, I giant field. You get some idea of the way they produced the fields in those days. Yeah, uh, March 1931. Uh, well, the Wortham field. Uh, in two months, they drilled 322 wells and basically had them producing wide open. Uh, the Powell, they drilled 827 wells in six months. The Mejia, they drilled 544 uh, in three months. You know, that's a uh, pretty rapid development. This information also shows up in Muscat, and what the reason it was in Muscat is in the old days there was. Uh, a lot of controversy about uh, recovery efficiency based on spacing. You know, what's the optimum that you should actually space wells in a given field? So this even shows up in uh, a, a muscat. But you have to remember, we're looking now at three different fields, uh, a different size acreage. They've got different thicknesses, different number of wells. Everything's different about the field. Okay, they're all different. But they're in the same general area. They're uh, 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 sort of in the same formation. Well, in fact, they are in the same formation, not sort of. Yeah, this is what the rate time looks like on it. A uh, semilog plot. You know, a, a conventional way of actually plotting data. Uh, of the Powell field, it's in Woodbine on the fault line fields, and look at the rate versus time. Uh, one of the things we always, or that you should always do in analyzing rate time data is also plot you know, the well counts a function of time. Because yeah, uh, uh, one of the things that you have yet to look at uh, is the period that the well count is either reasonably constant or uh, if it's not, you have to normalize. Uh, total field production rate divided by number of wells. One fundamental reservoir engineering concept in that is a field that a reasonable high permeability that reaches a pseudo steady state very rapidly. Okay, uh, you can't. 
uh, 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 reinitialized during the transient period. You can only do that uh, in a pseudo steady state period. If it's uh, yeah, uh, if you really have a substantial uh, uh, transient period effect, you have to use uh, a superposition. Now, again, very fundamental concepts that you can look at all this data and be able to analyze and interpret. Well, now if you look at this early data, if you draw a semilog through there, look how far off that you'd be extrapolating your great time in order to get a production forecast and your ultimate reserve. Also keep in mind, have you ever looked at any enhanced recovery uh, papers that are published how the primary is always exponential? They'll extrapolate on exponential and the difference between what they get and what they've extrapolated, they're attributing to enhanced recovery. You see the impact? You're attributing a lot of additional reserves to enhanced recovery that don't belong there if the B value is high. Okay? Uh, you keep that in mind. And uh, something else, when you run models, I'll, I'll talk to you about it uh, uh, on uh, uh, with the guy in here. Once I have the model history match, I can go back and play what if. What if I had produced this field at constant lower pressure? What kind of decline exponent would I have gotten? Okay? Yeah, so you can get a value of B that you could use. Uh, you now make a discovery over here opposite and you say, well, I'm, I've got to make a forecast. I don't have very much information. You, you can't build a model. You can use the rate time equation. You've got to get a value of B. You say, well, oh, I ran this model. The B is 0 0.6. That's what you use on your forecast. Okay? Now, so you, uh, uh, you can utilize other approaches uh, like running models in order to help you understand uh, what rate time behavior uh, would look like on that field, even though you never produced it that way, for, uh, for other applications. Uh, we've used this a lot to to uh, you be able to answer questions on other fields or or uh, you know, the method. Uh, you can end up with uh, a better method of analogy than this uh, uh, rate time data analysis. Okay, here's a plot uh, 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 rate versus time. Uh, well, the Wortham field, and it's got a B value of 0.5. That's fantastic data. Uh, it all fits uh, with a type curve with a B of 0.5. This particular plot. Uh, this is our computer program that they only were uh, uh, sort of displaying uh, 0 0.0, 0 0.4, and 1. Well, it exactly fits a 0.5. It's full water drive. Uh, ARP's example that he has in his original paper uh, of uh, hyperbolic is, a, is a, a well with a B of 0.5. Uh, when you dig into it, it's from the Arbuckle in Kansas, which is a carbonate, which is for water drive. It's a B of 0.5. You read the case history papers that we have in our uh, uh, case history decline curve paper, if you have any questions, ask Mike because he was a co-author on that paper. You know, so you, you have somebody to talk to here. Uh, we'll take advantage of it, really. And the uh, Salawati Island fields, the f uh, full water drive, reef reservoirs, carbonates, would be a 0.5. Uh, 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 if somebody, you know, if you're in an area and say, well, uh, uh, the field in this area have a uh, uh, full water drive. You can use that value B in order to make your forecast. Okay. You got involved in an acquisition in uh, Australia. Uh, uh, we've got some property now, and I can't remember whether it was Exxon's uh, model. That they had history matched uh, uh, and they'd run, and it turned out it was the basically full water drive. We got the forecast or predictions out of the model and plotted at rate time. It had to be a 0.5. Guess what? No. 
recently, he, uh, Curtis Whitson took some work that Standing did up at uh, Trondheim on a, uh, a layer, no cross flow water drive you know, type reservoirs. Uh, and I think also homogeneous using the Buckley Leverett equation, and when you plot the data log, log you get a uh, B of about 0.45. That's close enough. Nobody had ever done any work on uh, our displacement. Everything that I'm going to be talking to you about here from a derivation standpoint is uh, is basically depletion. Uh, but I am throwing in the idea that here's some observed data. Uh, and this was the observation that I made that I asked my uh, your colleague to set up a model and uh, let's see what you can get with regard to, to uh, uh, if you in some way can reproduce a B value of 0.5. He couldn't. You know, he said, well, something's wrong with your data. If something's wrong with the premises that you input into your model sometimes, okay? Always keep, uh, don't believe everything that you put into your model. Okay, there's the work and field again plotted on. I'm going to sit down for this exercise. That's the work and field. Okay, log log. That's the pile. Uh, well, the Mejia, I think you've got a copy of this, but I don't have them uh, exactly overlaid uh, in there. You know, you have to do this kind of individually, but yeah, I could do a better job in that if, if I wasn't in class, but uh, uh, interesting, they all overlay each other. They're only shifted on the axes by the difference in reservoir properties. You know, this is the whole concept of a dimensionless solution. Uh, it also says if I have a f uh, an adjacent field that I have uh, rate time data on, and I make a, a new discovery, uh, this is the perfect method of analogy. You know, that this is exactly the way it should behave on log log paper. And that if I have some of the early production performance in here, I could overlay it on the other field's log log plot, just draw the line. Uh, I fit the data, draw the line, I've got real time, and then I can go and I can read off the rate versus time, let's say at the mid-year of each year, and I've got my production forecast in 15 minutes. How long would it take for you to kind of set up a model to maybe solve the same type problem? You know, these are three different fields. The thicknesses are different, porosity is different, permeability is different, the spacing is different. Uh, but they all overlay each other. You have to think about that for a while to uh, understand the implications. And they all have a B of 0.5. 